Hello, welcome to another episode of the Wide World of Science. I'm your host, renowned scientific historian Matthew D. O'Reilly. Today we explore one of the most consequential and controversial scientific figures of the 20th and 21st century, James Dewey Watson, a name now synonymous with the discovery of the structure of DNA, due to his work alongside Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins, for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. In accepting the award, the young Watson remarked, It is often hard to have confidence that you really know where the future lies. We must thus believe strongly in our ideas, often to the point where they may seem tiresome and bothersome, and even arrogant to our colleagues. This statement would prove to be deeply insightful into Watson the man, a figure of undeniable intelligence, yet beset by strong rivalries and irksome qualities. Despite his undeniable achievements in theorizing the composition and structure of the DNA molecule, Watson has become more prominently known in modern times for comments supporting eugenics and other racist genetic practices. Even in the afterglow of his Nobel fame, other scientists accused Watson of misrepresenting his own achievements in subsequent memoirs. So who is the real James Watson? A scientific giant whose work paved the way for modern achievements such as a human genome project? Or a fringe scientist who has supported what can be at best described as pseudoscience? Although modern public opinion has turned sharply against Mr. Watson, his role in the discovery of DNA does not deserve to be scrubbed from history. James Watson was born April 6, 1928 in Chicago, Illinois, and immediately began to show intellectual promise from a young age, even participating on the popular radio show Quiz Kids. He showed such promise that he received a university scholarship at the age of just 15, studying zoology at the University of Chicago before going on to obtain a PhD in the same subject. It was while obtaining his doctorate that Watson was first exposed to the field of X-ray studies, which he would use to conduct his thesis research on bacteriophage. The most important moment in the young Watson's academic career, however, came when he attended a meeting in Cold Spring Harbors in New York and learned of early research on the molecule of DNA. After the conference, Watson developed a theory that DNA was responsible for the transfer of genetic information, an interest that would immediately overtake his current research into viruses. Fate must have led the young Watson to meet Maurice Wilkins at a conference in Naples, as Wilkins would go on to show Watson early attempts to photograph DNA using X-ray diffractions. Watson became so enamored with this research that he quit his job and moved to England, where he joined the Cavendish Laboratory. It is in this laboratory that Watson would be partnered with Francis Crick, and the pair immediately began building models of DNA in an attempt to deduce its structure. During this time period, a race of sorts had developed between competing scientists, all attempting to discover the true structure of DNA and secure their place in scientific history. This was a race with no second place, and Watson had his sights dead set on victory. Despite this, Watson and Crick's first model proved to be an absolute failure, receiving pointed criticism from their peers, with a woman named Rosalind Franklin providing the most scathing. Franklin showed numerous errors in the men's work, including their failure to recognize the two different types of DNA present, and for placing nitrogen atoms on the outside of the structure. In part due to Franklin's criticism, Watson and Crick were ordered to abandon their DNA modeling efforts. Although this may have been Watson's first encounter with Franklin, it would certainly not be his last. Having faced public humiliation for failing to heed Franklin's research once, Watson would not fall victim to the same fate once again, by any means necessary. It is at this point in our story where we come to the most controversial point of the young James Watson's life. Although the exact accounts on, of events differ, it is clear that Maurice Wilkins, who worked alongside Rosalind Franklin at King's College, gave Watson the now famous Photo 51, produced by Franklin, depicting the clearest picture of DNA at that point in time. In Watson's own words, the photograph was nothing short of a revelation. The instant I saw the picture, my mouth fell open and my pulse began to race. The pattern was unbelievably simpler than those obtained previously, A form. Moreover, the black cross of reflections which dominated the picture could only arise from a helical structure. Using this photo, Watson and Crick quickly developed a double-stranded helix-style model of DNA. Using this model, 
Watson was able to show that the A to T and C to G pairings of the nitrogen bases serves to replicate and pass on DNA sequences during cell formation. Alongside Wilkins and Crick, Watson would go on to publish their findings on DNA in 1953 and be awarded the Nobel Prize in 1962. Herein lies the greatest controversy, as Rosalind Franklin received little to no credit for her extremely important role in the discovery. Franklin sadly passed away from ovarian cancer in 1958, therefore disqualifying her from receiving the actual Nobel Prize, which is not awarded posthumously. Not only did the men fail to give her adequate credit for her x-ray work and contributions, Watson went on to paint a highly negative view of Franklin in his memoir, The Double Helix, even condescendingly referring to her as Rosie. Although Watson's memoir went on to be very financially successful, many of the other scientists mentioned in the text spoke up against Watson's account of events and portrayal of his colleagues, causing many publishers, including the Harvard Press, to refuse to publish the book. During his later career, Watson would most notably serve as Chancellor of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, the very institute at which he fatefully heard his first lecture on DNA. Watson brought the laboratory out of serious financial trouble, however also laid the foundation for a series of controversial personal statements while serving as Chancellor. In 2007, Watson publicly supported theories on race-based intelligence and specifically people of African descent, having inferior genetic material. Due to these comments, he was forced to resign as Chancellor of Cold Spring. Watson continued to make other controversial statements on a range of topics, expressing support for genetic screening to remove undesirable traits, including homosexuality or stupidity. More recently, Watson became the first Nobel laureate to auction his medal, selling it for a reported $4.1 million. So who is the real James Watson? It's hard to say. Watson was a man of undeniable drive and intelligence a gifted scientist who was determined to work his way into the history books. Regardless of anything else, Watson did have a very real impact on the discovery of DNA. But Watson's actions surrounding Rosalind Franklin, the use of her data without permission, and the subsequent smearing of her name in the, his memoir all point to the deeper character flaws that would eventually discredit Watson. In viewing the career of James Watson, there is certainly an important lesson to be learned. Just because someone is intelligent on one subject, doesn't make them smart in another. Thank you very much for joining me for another wonderful episode of The Wide World of Science. As always, it's been a pleasure. Stay curious, Earth.